I think your analysis was very straight line. This shoe doesn't run in a straight line. Kid, you cannot tell your neighbor he is stealing ducks when you are stealing phones. As High Commissioner, I was wrong. As Charandas Prasad, I reacted naturally how any person would have. I did not come here for, for, for that kind of abuse. I did not come here for that kind of abuse. If you're gonna go along that road, I'll walk off. But it's all okay once they're talking. If they were talking, I could not have been here today. You got ADHD, uh -huh. ADHD. I got that. Like that. Like that. Oh, no, calm down, no, calm down. I think I've done enough in terms of taking our team um, out of trouble from losing. Come on, Lou Taylor. You, 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 got, you got screwed. I'm reading the script now, and the first person that comes to my mind to play a detective, yes, but an erratic detective, Michael Rodriguez. Because nobody wants to hear me now. Why you not freaking supper in now? Why a man and supper woman? Look, how you deal with that? You deal with that. Now you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. We must encourage platforms like this because it brings together different people and allows for discussions. To, to take place in our country on a multiplicity of fundamental issues. Uh, Kingdom, you apologizing for no, something no, 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 you no, think no, no. I did is wrong. I don't no, want no. you to do that and you should not have done that. Hello there, welcome to the Gildari Freddy Kisun show. In this nine hours in front of us, it's good morning to Guyanese in India, five hours in London where our guest tonight lives. So it's good morning to Guyanese in UK. So it's good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are based on the time zone. This is the Gildari Freddy Kisun show. We come to you live. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 8.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. You can get us live on TBN uh, platform. Just type in TBN Guyana. Go to Guyanese Critic Facebook page or YouTube. Leonard Gildari has the flu, so he won't be here this evening. Let's hope it's not COVID. Our guest this evening is one of Guyana's most accomplished scholars in the area of the humanities and social sciences. He is one of the most accomplished historians that Guyana has produced, a prolific academic that has written nonfiction books, historical books that are simply enthralling. Two of those books tonight are so stimulating and arouse your curiosity that we're going to be discussing it. This man has written, perhaps with the exception of Australia, has written a two-volume history of cricket in Guyana, and two more volumes are coming up. The third volume will be the end of this year. So that will be four volumes of 100 years of cricket in Guyana. But if you think he only writes in cricket, he writes on profound sociological horizons in Guyana. And we will spend the next hour in a exercise of theorizing with our guest. This theorizing, you may not like his theories. You may find some of his theories a bit hard to absorb but the theories are interesting. I certainly found one of the theories in his book. I will focus on the book this evening, very absorbing. Our guest this evening is Professor Clem Sicheran. Clem, thanks a lot for being Thank here. You. It's a great pleasure, Freddie. It's a great honor to be on your show. I will feature your books, but let me tell the Guyanese people before you, um, before we go into the two controversial books, you have completed two volumes of a history of cricket in Ghana by hand in hand that sponsored it, 
and then you are in Guyana because this book was launched last evening. A biography of one of the great test players that Guyana and the West Indies produce. A Barbitian like Clem C. Chiran, and a Barbitian like some of the great cricketers the West Indies have produced. This is a biography of Joe Solomon, and Clem C. Chiran was here in, is here in Guyana in the launching of this, which took place last evening. We will show you more of the books of this prolific scholar. But before we do that, I want to start on a light note. Clem, I want to go back to an incident for to two years ago. That's a very long time. Just say yes, if you remember it. Just say no, and then we get into our discussion. A group of Caribbean graduate students, including myself, were at a table at the University of Toronto. I don't think you were at our table. I think you were a nearby table. And you got into an argument with a white student. And he looked threatening. And one of my friends from the table got up and said to the white man, leave him alone or I'll joke your eyes out. That was 42 years ago. The white guy didn't understand the Jamaican <laughs> accent and what and joke your eyes out. But the white guy backed out. That is how long I have known Clem Chiran. Now, just say yes or no if you remember that. Um, yes, Freddie. That was in my youth. A long, long time ago. But it was in my youth too. So I have known Clem Chiran <laughs> that long. Now, Clem, um, <laughs> How have you been doing? You live in London, and um, I know you have um, you returned recently to receive a book, the Guyana Prize for the best book in nonfiction, which is Joe Solomon's book. And then you have achieved the distinction of winning the Elsa Gavaya Prize one year for the best book in history the book on Sir Jack Campbell, the head of Booker's Plantation in Guyana. This book has some serious statements made by researcher Clem Chiran, which we'll have to debate this evening. I am suggesting to you viewers there, if your friends, relatives, and families have do not see this program this evening, please ask them to go on YouTube because this is going to be an interesting discussion with Clem Chiran on Rohan Kanai, Chedi Jagan, and East Indians in Guyana. Clem, let's start with, continue on the light vein. You have been a fantastic historian. You have done so many articles in journals, so many books. Um, is it time to just come home and do a one-year stint at UG? I cannot see anyone in this country, anyone disagreeing with you having the Walter Rodney Chair at the University of Guyana. If the concerned parties are listening, I am saying unambiguously with pellucid enormity. I don't think there's a Guyanese in the diaspora or in Guyana that is more eligible to sit in the Walter Rodney chair in history than Professor Clem C. Chiran. Clem, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if the chair is offered, I know you have your family in London, you've been married as long as I am, for something years, more than 45 years, um, would you accept the Walter Rodney chair? I don't, I don't think that is likely to come up at all, Freddie. Um, that is not an issue that's likely to come up. I don't think so. And um, I'm engaged in a wide range of research now. And this research really can only be done, unfortunately, can only be done in, in England. Um, I told you that I'm working I'm on the third volume of the Hand in Hand History of Cricket in Guyana. Um, I'm hoping to do a fourth volume, which will 
take us from 1865 to 1966. So it's been a, a massive project, and um, I'm greatly honored that, um, you know, Hand in Hand have sponsored this uh, project over the last seven or eight years or so. So I do have a very tight research schedule and um, so I don't think I don't think that question would come up. And, but in any case, I don't think that the University of Guyana uh, would offer me such a position. No, I don't think so. Do you know what a sad statement that is? <laughs> and do you know how disappointing <laughs> that is for people? Here are three <laughs> fantastic books that you have written. <laughs> and plus many other books, plus the full volume of a history of cricket in Guyana. Uh, yes, really. And you are telling me that you don't think the university, well, I'll tell you this. <laughs> After this interview tonight, I will make that, I will make that a theme. I, will, I think we've had Clem Sichuan, we've had problems in this country with Guyanese of unique quality not being recognized. There is a Chutney Soka singer who pioneered Chutney Soka genre in Guyana more than 40 years now. And he complained that he's not being recognized. The president heard that and President Ali has called him in. Then we have in the introduction to this program, we had Mahadio Shivraj. We interviewed him for one hour. That man has made some very, very good films. The equivalent to the time kind you see in Jamaica that is so patronized in Jamaica. And he said, listen, I am not being recognized. And then we have the wife of the famous Guyanese icon, Christopher Kitna Cimento, Jem Madhu, been in theatre for 40 years, and she said, no one calls me. I have not been given uh, any uh, award or anything. Now, you have one of Guyana's most acclaimed historians. Look, look at the books. Clem Cicheran, Cricket and Indian Identity in Colonial Guyana, 1890s. To 1960. Joe Solomon and the Spirit of Port Morant, the making of the Guyana and West Indies cricketer and its context 1930 to 1960. And Sweetening Bitter Sugar, Jock Campbell, the Booker Reformer in British Guyana, 1934-1966. This book won the Elsa Gavaya Prize for the best history book in that year. And you are telling me, Clem Cicheran, that University of Guyana, we will see about that. This program has a wide, wide platform. Clem, day before yesterday, in the evening, the guest was Kit Nascimento. And Kit Nascimento said to our viewers that he has finally decided to write his autobiography. And he will have a ghostwriter. And I said to him, I hope it's Clem Cicheran. <laughs> and he said, no, uh, he'd already have someone. And it's an uh, um, uh, 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 outstanding academic. But your name came up um, right away. Is there anything you want to say before we go into some serious sociological theorizing in this book from Ranji to Rohan because this is going to take up some time and your theories in this book here, Sweetening Bitter Sugar. So is there anything you want to say before we get into some serious heavy intellectual stuff? Yes, yes, Freddy. Um, I'd like to say something about the problems that researchers have in this country. Because we have shown no respect at all for our historical documents. And decade after decade, we have allowed our documents to go to ruin, to disintegrate, literally disintegrate in your hands. And it's a total disgrace that we have got a place called the National Library, named after our greatest historian, 
the uh, archives, Walter Rodney. Sorry, the, the archives, the Walter Rodney archives. And so many of the documents have been lost, have been destroyed. I couldn't do the research I've done for many of these books if I were only based here in Guyana. And I feel it's extremely important that we try to preserve what we have. The other thing is, you cannot, as a historian, as a serious researcher in Guyana, complete most of this work unless you go to the United Kingdom, unless you go to the National Archives at Kew, unless you go to the British Library or, or, or the Bodleian Library at Oxford. And to do that, you have to be sponsored. So our serious researchers at the University of Guyana, our serious researchers here in this country must get some kind of help. I mean, both from the government as well as corporate help. I should point out that the book uh, we're talking about here tonight, one of the books, uh, Joe Who Solomon. Which we launched, Joe Solomon. Yeah. Yes, which we launched last night at Border. Joe Solomon and the Spirit of Port Morant um, was, is sponsored by Demerara de Silas Limited. The, um, the four volume history I'm working on is sponsored by Hand in Hand. Now, this could not have been done because research is very expensive. And I'm based in England, but still it's extremely expensive. You've got to travel to London. The expenses there, London is a very expensive city. So I think all of these things have to be factored in when we speak of a new generation of researchers, people coming out of the University of Guyana who want to be professional historians or, or even you know sociologists, anthropologists, whatever, need help to be able to accomplish this. And this is very important. I don't think we have really addressed this question. And now that we are likely to become quite rich, I'm told, I feel that this should be given priority. Our young researchers must be given help to be able to do this kind of work. I mean, I've just, I'm one of the pioneers, I guess, and I've just scratched the surface. There are new generation of scholars who will be coming along and they need help, both government as well as corporate help. I'm grateful to Hand in Hand and DDL for helping me with this, but new generation scholars must get help. Well, let's look at the title. Let us keep emphasizing the titles of three of your books that I have here, one of which, thank you, you brought tonight for me, Joe Solomon and the Spirit of Port Moran. In fact, I, I bought Sweetening Bitter Sugar, Chuck Campbell, the Book of Reform in British Guyana, and you can see the price tag is still here. Um, maybe I should ask you back for my money. I bought this at um I bought this at um that bookstore in um Austin. Well, how much? What's the cost? Seven thousand three hundred and eighty dollars. What is that in pounds? I don't know much in pounds, but I known you for so long. So I thank you for giving me Joe Solomon's yeah, but, but book. Just a minute. Could you please give me back my money? So this me? here, did you have food left in the house after you bought that? What your wife said. Seven thousand. What your wife told you after you bought that thing? Um, ask back Clem because she knew about the incident. At uh, University of Toronto 42 years ago, she said, ask Clem back for your money. Well, I bought this so long ago at Austin Bookstore, one of the best books in history in Guyana, that now that you're here, you brought the Joe Solomon book for me, I think I should ask you back for my 7,000. But um, let us now enter the realm of the scholarship of Clem C. Chiran. As viewers can see, I put some, uh, I put the pages that I want to read here from from Ranji to Rohan, uh, Rohan Kanai. Let me um, let me read the back flap here, and then we go into some serious theorizing by Professor Clemsi Iran. Clemsi Chiran. From the late 19th century, cricket was central to being West Indian in the British West Indies. By the 1890s, a small Indian middle class in British Guyana, descendants of Bonkulis, 
taken from Minja after slavery, began to advance their own credentials of belonging to the region. They sought to forge an identity inspired by Mother India's cultural resurgence in conjunction with the Creole sensibility of their new homeland permeated by British imperial culture. This book explores the role of cricket in shaping indo guyanese identity from Ranji's example, Ranji the first Indian to play cricket for the UK, for England, through the seminal achievement of cricketers such as the mercurial genius of Rohan Kanai. This book is framed by the complex sushi socio-cultural milieu of colonial Guyana, culminating in the shifting perceptions by Indian Guyanese of the two heroes towards the end of empire, Rohan Kanai and Chedi Jagan. Let me read that back again because this is where the intellectualism of Clem Chiran is going to flow. This is framed by the complex sociological socio-cultural milieu of colonial Guyana, culminating in the shifting perceptions by indo guyanese of their two heroes toward the end of empire, Rohan Kanai and Chedi Jagan. Anyone listening to me would know that you have described Rohan Kanai as a Guyanese hero in the same company, in the same complexion of Chedi Jagan. Do you stand by that? Yes, I do. I do. Um, because I continue the theme in this book, Joe Solomon and the Spirit of Port Morant, because we have a tendency to sort of lump all these plantations together and say, oh, it was totally exploitative. Nothing good came out of this. And that's wrong, because if that's the case, we may as well go home and don't do any further research. Because we have to be able to make a distinction between different environments. And what history seeks to do, and especially the way I write the history of our cricketers, is to situate them in the context in which they emerged. Not just to say so-and-so scored so many centuries or so-and-so got so many wickets, but to understand the forces that shaped these individuals. And Port Perant was one of those extraordinary plantations. Not only did they produce these outstanding cricketers, and by that I mean Rohan Kanhai, Joe Solomon, Basil and Butcher. Basil Butcher, but Alvin Kalicharan. Alvin Kalicharan as well, but, and of course, Jerry Jagan. But long before that, you had a, a tradition in which several people from Port Perant went on to study medicine, went on to study law, became educationists. Some of them became, uh, went into business. There was something, and that is why I called the book the Joe Solomon and the spirit of Port Morant, because I believe that it was a unique plantation. We can talk about that. Okay. For those who are viewing <clears throat> this program, I once again put this book into your focus, from Ranji to Rohan. And I am going to now describe a theory by Professor Clem C. Chiran that has profound sociological significance for modern sociology in Guyana. I think the sociological postulation of this book would have missed a lot of Guyanese academics and ordinary people, simply because if you go on the bookshelf and you look at the title from Ranji to Rohan, Cricket and Indian Identity in Colonial Guyana, you will say, yes, this is an intriguing historical book. But here is the point that Clem is making, and he will correct me if I'm wrong, but I read the book. I read the book right out, and I know I was going to interview him tonight, and I look back at the parts, and I make some notes. Here is what Clem Cicheran is postulating in this book about Rohan Kanai. 
let me take a minute break because this is profound. And this is why when I heard he was in Guyana, I said, we got to put him in front of the cameras to the thousands of viewers that viewed this program. This book is contending that Indians in Guyana after indentureship wanted to belong, saw that Guyana was part of them, but there was a vacuum the way they were perceived, the way they were treated. So they were looking for heroes, looking for heroes so they can have a fulcrum to stand on and say, we are Indians. And the Indians in Guyana found two heroes, Rohan Kanai, but four and most, Chedi Jagan. And Chedi Jagan became their, their embrace. Chedi Jagan became their heart throb. While at the same time, Kanai was doing his thing. But Clem is contending that in the struggle of Chedi Jagan, and Chedi Jagan, this charismatic Indian guy who Indians look up to, he began to face serious confrontations. And in 1964, he lost power. So he was demobilized. It's like if one of the Indian heroes fell and the Indians now have a problem of identity, of belonging, because the heroes, can I, and Chedi Jagan were keeping them alive. And then the big one, Chedi Jagan, went down. And here is what, here is what Clem is saying. Clem is saying that when Chedi went down, Indians now put their faith, put their hopes and dreams in Rohan Kanai. Kanai now was supposed to take up where Chedi Jagan left off. He was supposed to keep the Indian dream alive, the Indian spirit, and Rohan Kanai did that. That is a profound sociological theory. Well, can I then, can I yes. then, is more than just a cricketer well, in Chinese uh, history? Well, well, precisely, because um, you mentioned earlier um, the indo guyanese quest to belong, to want to be genuinely a part of this, uh, of, as it was then, a colony. But cricket, for West Indians as a whole, wasn't just a game. It was an important instrument for their own development. It was a means of asserting a West Indian identity and Indians here wanted to be a part of that process. And therefore, to be a part of that process, you had to be able to play this game, this game, all ethnic groups, not only the white West Indians or African or black West Indians or people of mixed heritage, but interestingly enough in the research I've done, the Portuguese, the Chinese, all of these different ethnic groups were playing the game throughout British Guyana. And it's the same thing with the Indians. And they were inspired. This is what the book deals with. They were inspired in the 1890s by uh, Ranjit Sinji. Ranjit Sinji was an Indian prince. And every day the British Guyana newspapers, the Chronicle, the Daily Chronicle, the Daily Argosy, would carry something about Ranji's achievements in England. In fact, Ranji was among the three top cricketers in the world in the 1890s. So you can imagine what this meant for Indians in this country on the plantations, with each day seeing something about this man. And this inspired them. And Port Morant was one of those places where at a very early stage, people started to play this game. I tell you something, a man came from India, um, an Indian, an, an English administrator, came to British Guyana in 1891, I think it was, 
and he was greatly impressed by the conditions of, Port, of people at Port Morant. It had a higher standard of living generally. It was the more progressive plantations. And the Indians were playing cricket. And he said he went to the manager at Port Morant and he said, you know, I have some of these indentured laborers here. And they asked me for three days leave. So he said, I gave them three days leave. And instead of they said they wanted to go and do their rice field, rice work. He said they didn't go to their rice field. They went and played cricket for three days. Then they went to their rice field. So he said, I took them to court for breach of contract. <laughs> and he said, when the people heard that they only had to pay a small fine of, of, of um, something like, I don't know, seven dollars or something, seven dollars um they said well look here seven dollars or one week in jail so they said oh seven dollars that's too much man so they went and spent one week in jail and i like that to actually think happened. Yeah, it actually happened it was covered in the report by a man named cummins dwd cummins so i like to think that port morant was already a place where the people were so drawn to this game that they were even prepared to go to jail for the sake of the game. And they had a progressive manager there from 1908 to 1938, a man named J.C. Gibson. And what he did was, not only did he create a proper cricket ground, but he also enabled people to grow a little bit of rice, to rear, to rear cattle, to have a certain amount of freedom, but not total freedom to make them independent of the plantation. He, he also had a small locomotive to take them into the backlands so they didn't have to walk through the mud and get tired by the time they got to the fields. These were all things that I believe gave Port Morant, that, that spirit of Port Morant, um, a sense that they really could achieve things. They, they felt that they had possibilities. You see, if they were totally ground down, I don't believe this place would have produced so many progressive people already from the beginning of the 20th century. It was a remarkable place. And that is the place that produced Kanhai. That was also the place that produced, um, that produced uh, Chedi Jagan. But Kanhai was more than a, a West Indian cricketer. To many of the Indians in this country, he represented a kind of a rival that we are now accepted to produce a great West Indian cricketer like Rohan Kanhai was to really arrive. And of course, Joe Solomon. Joe played in 14 of the 15 test matches, captained by Frank Worrell, who was the first black captain of the West Indies team. And in 14 of the 15 matches that Frank Worrell captain, Joe played. Now, Joe was a totally different kind of player. He was a much more orthodox player. He um, didn't have the flair and the range of strokes that Kanai had. But Frank Worrell saw the importance of Joe at number six. That when the great uh, attractive batsmen like um, Conrad Hunt and Rohan Kanai and Gary Sobers got out early, that Joe could stay with the fellas at the bottom there and build a big score, uh, take the score along. So Joe, Basil Butcher, Rohan Kanhai, imagine the number three batsman, the number four batsman, and the number six batsman came from the same plantation. These were the chief batsmen in the West Indies team under Frank Worrell. So you, you, you see, this is quite a, a, a remarkable thing. Okay, let me um, let me emphasize again what you have adumbrated in this book, the sociological and uh, cultural theory of one canai that you have adumbrated in this book. I'm going to read uh, some selected parts in which you have left Rohan Kanai out of sports and put him in a context where he is seen as 
someone to save an ethnic community. Now let me quote what you said here of Kanai on page 149, and I'm going to ask viewers to pay careful attention because this is a, a, a theory of Rohan Kanai that has not been made at any time in the history of Guyana and is only contained in this book. And I was quite stunned when I read this book and saw how Clem C. Chiran situated Kanai in the Indian consciousness of this country. The same rebellious temperament took shape in Rohan Kanai, but it is necessary to repeat that it's, uh, it originated because of a comparative, more progressive environment at Pope Morant than any, any other plantation. The rebel in Jagan and Kanai was engendered by hope and possibilities of greater achievement, not despair or the death of ambition. That was why in the indo guyanese identity, Jagan and Kanai were interchangeable. Let me repeat that again. That was why in the indo guyanese identity construct, in the Guyanese identity construct, Jagan and Kanai were interchangeable. Well, if Jagan and Kanai were interchangeable, we are seeing an importance of Kanai in the 50s and 60s that no other history book has ever described. Let me read quote now 193, and then we'll come to your explanation. indo guyanese now saddled with Kanai with the task of liberator, he had to atone for the perceived impending fall of Jagon. I mean, what more can I say about how you've lifted Kanai and put him in a position of the existential temperament of Indians? So, is, was Kanai that important as a historical figure to Indian people, the way Indian politicians were in that period? I, 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 yes, I would, I would say that. And, um, you know, that is what sports, that is what sport does to people. Um, and for people who see themselves as oppressed or downtrodden, great sportsmen and great sportswomen are very important, very important to them. And in the case of uh, Rohan Kanhai, we are dealing here with um, a man who had a certain flair. He had a uniqueness. That picture of him falling on the ground while the ball is hit out of the boundary, um, a square leg, I think that speaks for itself. There was a kind of power there. There was a kind of magic. There was a there was an art. It was a source of liberation. The same way great footballers, great technicians. In, in I wonder sport. if our camera could capture this. You, you know, that's Rohan can I fall in on the ground after hitting either a four or a six. That's what Clem is talking about. And there are many other photographs of him falling on the ground. Um, just um, this is the young, handsome Ron Kanai and his wife in the early 60s. Um, I got to watch it my time because we got to get into this book and what Clem has to say about Jagon. But Clem, uh, this is the first time, this is the first time in any history book, a researcher, a scholar is saying, Rohan Kanai was more than a great cricketer to Guyana. Rohan Kanai occupied in the psyche of Guyanese in the first half of the 20th century some a symbol the way Jagan had symbolized the achievement of Indians. Yes, and um you know, it, as I said, it started. So he's with, one of the great Indians of Guyana. Well, he he, he is he's a great um, one of the great cricketers of the world, but in the context of uh, Guyana, he could not 
be seen simply as a cricketer. And for Indians in particular, irrespective of how Kanhai saw himself, and maybe he could not even identify with the way people saw him. And it, it caused him um, some confusion in a way. He couldn't understand maybe the role that he was cut out for. But that is what great sports people do. Their people look up to them in a way. It makes them feel that, that here is somebody who represents me, who can lift me out of the kind of misery I'm in, however temporarily. But it shows, and because cricket has played such a very important role in our development as West Indian people, I think here you had the first Indian in Guyana who was at the highest level of West Indies cricket and world cricket. It was a phenomenal achievement because cricketers were seen almost like great Nobel Prize winners. You know, they weren't just ordinary sports people. They were way beyond that. That is why C.L.R. James in his great book, in his classic, um, Beyond the Boundary, which was published in 1963, takes these cricketers of the past and place them beyond the boundary because they were speaking for people um, at all levels of society and for the downtrodden here in, in, in the West Indies and in Guyana. Uh, somebody like Han Hai just couldn't be seen as a, as a mere cricketer. So we, we have now we have now, when we're looking at great historical figures of different ethnic communities, yeah. we have Ron Kanai, who his community, his people saw as more than just a cricketer. Now, here is what I heard. Here is what I've been told, speaking directly from one of Ron Kanai's very close friends, is that this burden that Kanai bore that you have in his book, affected him, affected his psyche, and that he's a very sad person. And um, his friend told me that part of the sadness is, um, can I doesn't see Guyana as acknowledging what he did for Guyana and for Indian people. And his close friend tells me that it, it weighs on him. Well, it's quite likely is that um, in material terms, he got very little from the game. That's the reality. And from Guyana? And from Guyana. Um, in material terms, he probably got very little indeed. But as James always said, you've got to situate these people beyond the boundary. You've got to situate them in the context of the people's history, in, this, in terms of their social history. And however Kanhai feels, that is immaterial to the point I'm making here, that the people had redefined him in terms of their own psychic needs, their own mm -hmm. psychic requirements, and they constructed him in a particular way, as a kind of liberator. And that is why I make the, the analogy between him and Chedi Jagan, that um, in the same way that they saw Chedi Jagan as the great leader who um, had challenged the plantocracy and was instrumental in pushing the kinds of reforms that Campbell adopted on the plantations, and nobody can deny that, that the plantations that, that, that Campbell had, uh, created by the 1950s were vastly different from the plantations of the 20s and the 30s. And you, and you have to acknowledge these things as, as a historian. Um, I, I understand that, um, but I think your book may have contributed to can, can I be more of an introvert because I understand he took on the characteristics of introversion, and like it's more pronounced in him. But of course, he's, he's in his late 80s and he's quite a rational man. His wife died the other day. He has his two kids who are doing well. I want to ask you before we go on to this, the book that you won the El Sigavaya Prize on, which you have to explain tonight for our viewers your position on Jagan 
a relation with Campbell and Campbell relation with Jagan. You have completed two volumes of quick history of cricketing Ghana. The third in a few months will be out, and then there's be a fourth volume. You wrote a book on Ranji and Kanai. So you have to be seen as someone who knows about cricket. I am giving you my opinion, which is not as deep as yours. I believe Ron Kanai is the best batsman Guyana produced. I, I mean no disrespect to Shif Chandrapal and his fantastic achievement and his statistics. But for me, it's Ron Kanai. Do you subscribe to that? Well, we produce a number of outstanding cricketers, um, batsmen, Rohan Kanai, Basil Butcher, Clive Lloyd, um, Shiv, um, Carl Hooper. These are among some of our, our, um, our outstanding batsmen. Um, I would say, yes, Rohan was, you know, at the top, at the top of his game. And I think that the Rohan Kanhai, who played under Frank Worrell's leadership in uh, nineteen um, in the nineteen early nineteen sixties, was really one of the great batsmen of the world. And the style and the flair of the man. Um, yes, I, I put him. I put him right up at the top. Okay, we're please. going to leave the great Rohan Kanhai, but before we go to. Sweetening bitter sugar, Jock Campbell, the book of reform in British Guiana. Before we go to one quick question, you have any intention of stepping? Uh, you live in the UK. Can I live there? You have any intention of paying him a visit? Um, well, I don't know where Mr. Kanai lives, and I have no contact at all with him. And um, I'm not sure whether he's interested in seeing me. Um, you wrote a, 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 a great know. academic <laughs> uh, theory about his role in Guyana. Let's go now to your one of Guyana's best history books, won the El Segovia Prize. Um, you juxtapose Jack Campbell with Chedi Jagger. Now, I'm going to read what the back cover says here, and I'm going to ask you if there isn't some weakness in your theory looking back now, because so many of us were, were wrong about Jagon when we look back 40 years ago. Clem Cicheran explores the fascinating interplay between Campbell's program of reforms and the doctrinaire Marxism of Guyana's charismatic politician, Chedi Jagon. Fed by his notion of bitter sugar and an unrelenting hostility to Booker, Jagan exploited the loyalty of Indian sugar workers to foment instability of the plantations and thus undermines Campbell's mission to alleviate the colony's bitter plantation legacy. Don't you think that's an extreme statement? No, I, I don't think I don't think it's an extreme statement at all. Looking back at it. That's very harsh and jagger, man. Well, I I think that um, you know we have to look at what was happening there, and um, Cherry obviously by taking on the plantations in the from the late forties with the formation of the political affairs committee and in, into the nineteen the nineteen fifties, um, he was instrumental in bringing about a significant transformation of these plantations. The important thing here was that you couldn't do these reforms if you didn't have guaranteed prices for sugar and quotas in the international market. You've got to be able to fund these things. And Campbell certainly after 1953 and the suspension of the constitution, which we shan't go into. But he made a great effort to meet Chedi halfway. In many respects, he was a, an admirer of Jagan. And he said that to me many times. And he was hoping that he could work out a modus vivendi with Chedi. He also made a very strong recommendation, a confidential document, 
which I've seen and I've quoted to some extent here, where he recommended to the Book of Board in 1960 that they must support Chedi Jagan towards an in, in an independent Guyana. And he made that recommendation to Ian McLeod, who was a friend of his. McLeod was the Secretary of State for the Colonies. And he made that recommendation that, look, you've got to go with Jagan because he's the only leader worth supporting in Guyana. And the British government also made an effort to say, well, look, let's arrive at a compromise. There is no need for you to take a, a radical, um, an extreme position with regard to the Soviet Union versus the United States. That you can work, and Campbell certainly felt that although it might have been too little too late, that he could work with Jagan, that you could begin to transform not just the sugar industry, but Guyana. I mean, look, today, um, <laughs> I think Campbell would have been a, a great businessman in this country today. The kinds of things he was doing, you know, those kinds of things would be highly, highly um, accepted in this country today. So we all, we have to revisit these things and realize that Chetty's passion was great. He is a very decent man. He was an honorable man. He did not steal, you know. He made immense sacrifices. He gained nothing materially from being in politics, nothing at all. But he had a philosophical approach, which was almost a religious approach, and that made for inflexibility. If he had worked out a modus vivendi with Jock Campbell, I believe he would have got independence in 19... 62 or 1963. Let's look at, let's look at a word that um, you use here. And I'm wondering if, um, looking back now, this book was published in 2005. Obviously, it was written before 2005. Um, he ex Jagan exploited the loyalty of Indian sugar workers to foment instability on the plantation. Look, can't we get into the mind of Jagan? that here is a colony and you have a big huge white plantation and there's this guy so jock this guy jock campbell all right he is not a bad fellow he's not arrogant but this is my country and the plantation uh, you know they they, they they just should be given more um isn't it can we now look back after 50 years and see that maybe there was some validity to Chedi's passion, and that Chedi would have seen Jack Campbell as just another nice liberal. But that is not the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue is um, the empowerment of the sugar workers. Yes, but uh, remember, we were, we're talking here about um, Chedi and Campbell in the context of the Cold War. And if you embrace, as Chedi did, um, both the Soviet Union and Cuba as the model for economic and political transformation, it meant that you were taking British Guyana into the Cold War. And that meant you were taking on the United States. And the British were trying to advise him, well, look, if you take on America, they're going to screw you. And that was the context in which um, Kennedy advised uh, the CIA or counseled the CIA to get involved in this in the story here, because if Chedi had not taken a position which put him directly in the Soviet camp, he would have survived. He really believed, though, that that was the answer for Guyana's uh, problems. Ironically, while this was going on, you know, our people were <laughs> escaping to the heartlands of capitalism. So here you had a leader who was looking at the Soviet example as the example to follow, while at the same time, his supporters were migrating to the heartlands of capitalism. You know, 
So he he entered he entered the um, the, the Cold War, and because of that, um, you know we 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 were caught in this situation, and there couldn't be any compromise at all. There was no compromise there. What about if, despite that ideological passion, what about if, if at heart he wanted the empowerment of the sugar workers and he was not satisfied, he would have seen um, Jack Campbell as a piecemeal uh, achiever? Yes, he did see him as a piecemeal achiever. He saw any kind of uh, social reform as a kind of cop-out. So he couldn't arrive at a compromise at all. There could be no middle ground. There could be no meeting of the ways here at all. That, that, that was not possible. Would you, uh, would you, despite the postures, the ideological positions he took in the 40s and 50s, when you, when you examine the entire period from the 40s and 50s coming up to 2023, um, looking at Guyana 80 years ago and looking at the evolution of those 80 years and the people and all of them, would he not stand out as perhaps the most dedicated, honest, conscientious, humane politician that Guyana produced? I've always said that um, he was a very dedicated, honorable, very honest man. And he believed that, um, that you know, Soviet um, communism was the answer for Guyana. Um, but, you know, we have a fundamental uh, ethnic or racial problem in this country, and we've been afraid to address it. And what Marxism did was Marxism framed that whole problem within the context of class divisions, and we completely bypassed the fundamental question of ethnic insecurity in this country. It remains the biggest problem in this country until today. And Marxism failed to resolve those problems within the multinational Soviet Union itself. It was a total failure in terms of bringing different ethnic groups together. We, here in Guyana, we have also failed to address the question of ethnic insecurities. And we haven't been able to do that because we don't even want to talk about it. But it's a fundamental question. And I think that the politics of um, both our great leaders in this country, that the politics um, could not address this fundamental question, and it still remains the fundamental question in this country. So I think all our political leaders have been essentially failures. But in terms of integrity and dedication to I'm not, I'm not arguing with that at all, Freddy. I'm not arguing at all about Jerry's integrity and dedication. I don't have a problem with that. I'm saying that our two major political leaders have been failures because they failed to, un to address the fundamental question that we have in this country. But Chadi would have faced more formidable obstacles in trying to bring about some kind of ethnic solution than Burnham. I mean, Chadi was always at a disadvantage. Why was he? The, 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 um, the, the nature of uh, the American pressure even after independence, the nature of, uh, of the PNC, the violent nature of the PNC. Um, there is a theory that the PPP psyche is so tarnished and devastated by the consistent application of violence on the PPP since its, its birth. <laughs> I am just saying that that's a thing. I know, but to understand the, all of these things, we have to go back to our history and realize 
that we have never, we have never really addressed that fundamental question, Freddie. All the way back, long before the troubles uh, after the Second World War, those problems were there. I wrote a book, a huge book, called Mother India's Shadow of El Dorado, where I address many of these questions. You have never read it, and most people have never read it. I have addressed those questions because I wanted to point out that the kinds of insecurities we have today in this country have their roots way back in our history. And I have done that in a way, in a more comprehensive way than anybody else. And you must read the book, Freddie. Well, I, I, I have a suggestion. Um, when, when you're coming back, um, it's, it's, is it on Amazon? I know you, you wrote a book. But then if it's, it's not an Amazon, you have to bring a copy when you come back. If you're going to buy that, then you, uh, I don't know. What, what, this is 7,380. But I want cheap. Uh, so this, this mother in the thing is what? It's going to be how much? I mean, we got to uh, sell your car tire and so on. <laughs> I am. Um, our, our operator signaled to us that our time has come. I mean, you mentioned that compendious volume you've produced, another great history book. I, I think the Guyanese nation have to ask you to take up that chair in the name of another great historian. Clem Chichuan, what are your final thoughts about anything in the world, anything in Guyana, anything historical, or anything personal? Well, I want to go back to where I started. And that is, we must have a reverence for our historical documents. You know, we keep cussing the British all the time. We cuss, keep cussing colonialism. They left all these documents with us here, and the thing rotting away. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to use the, some of the petrodollar or Dorado, as John Mayer, your friend John Mayer calls it? How are we going to use this money? Aren't we going to try to do something of this nature so that we begin to understand the kinds of problems we have today? Because if we have no sense of history, we cannot understand the present. And there's a lot of work to be done there. The other thing is reading. My great friend Ian MacDonald always says that he is always disturbed when he sees that people don't want to read or people don't read. A bookless people, you know, and this thing is very worrying because we need to inculcate into our people the importance of reading. I started to read when I was six or seven years of age. I had a reverence for books. I worship books. I worship our early writers, the people who came, um, started to write in the 50s, people like V.S. Naipaul, people like Sam Selvon, people like Edgar Mitchell Holzer from my town of New Amsterdam. I grew up, I used to go and take the book and smell the new book. That's the kind of reverence I had for, for reading, Freddie. And we need to inculcate that into our people. So. Let us use this wealth to educate our people. We got a whole lot of people in this country who can't read, you know. <laughs> so I'm saying that is very important. We have to go through a process of re-education in which we address this fundamental question of ethnic insecurity. Ladies and gentlemen, Guyanese, wherever you are, if you Looking at your screen now, the man on my left is Professor Clem Cicheran, author of several great historical books, of which I have three here in the studio tonight. One of them, an unusual sociological theory of the cricketer Rohan Kanai. Clem Cicheran, one of Guyana's most accomplished scholars in the area of the humanities and the social sciences. Let us hope that someone has the sense, sensibility, rationality to discuss offering Clem Cicheran the position. It's, it's a temporary position. It's not a permanent position. 
of the Walter Rodney Trail at the University of Guyana. I will end this program with a definitive statement that the a very few historians guy, of Guyanese nationality that would qualify to more sit in the Walter Rodney Trail than Clem Suchiran. They don't come as prolific as Clem Suchiran. It was really more than just psychological comfort. It was an education talking to one of the great historians of Guyana, Clem Suchiran. If you relatives and family did not get to see this program this evening, please tell them to go on YouTube and see the program and listen and view the point that Clem is making about the great batsman of Guyana, Rohan Kanai. With those parting words, I have to say good night to you, Clem, and I, a safe journey on your way to the UK, and I'm looking forward to the third volume of the history of cricket in Guyana, which you said, said should be completed the end of this year. Clem, thanks a lot. Thank you, Brady. It's been a great pleasure to be here. Thank you.